Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have a full program today, and um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Yoon, the second vice chair of the Economic Club of Chicago. And um, welcome to our first forum of the 2023-24 program year um, on a topic I think that is on the forefront of almost every conversation about living and working in Chicago, which is public safety. So we're fortunate to have joined forces with the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago today to present the first coordinated response from the business community and to address what businesses of all sizes really can do to help lower violent crime in the city. Today, our panelists, um, we have for the first time in their new roles as co-chairs of the Civic Committee's Public Safety Task Force, Mark Hoppelmazian, CEO of Hyatt Hotels, and Eric Smith, Vice Chair of BMO Harris Bank. The Commercial Club had a very big shoes to fill left by the passing of Jim Crown. But we're fortunate to have Mark and Eric step into this very important role. So also today, we welcome Arnie Duncan, founder of Community Violence Intervention Leader, Chicago Cred, and Gary and Gatewood, Deputy Mayor of Community Safety for the City of Chicago. Today, our discussion will be moderated by Rosanna Ander, Executive Director of the University of Chicago Crime Labs. The full bio their full biographies are available at your tables by scanning the QR code. So welcome, Mark, Eric, Arnie, Garion, and Rosanna. We're gonna begin with opening remarks from Rosanna and then move into a moderated conversation with the full panel. We'll take questions from the audience toward the end of the program and we'll adjourn promptly at 1.30 p.m. So Rosanna, I will now turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and to the Economic Club and the Civic Committee for convening this important conversation. And thanks to all of you, including our esteemed panelists, for your efforts to make Chicago a healthy, vibrant, and prosperous city for all. I wanna stress that last part, for all. Public safety, which is fundamental to every other aspiration we have for our city, has not been accessible to all Chicagoans. It has long been a tale of two cities. I know that can change. And the, the decisions by people in this room and on this panel will have an outsized impact on whether it does. I wanna start by offering just a little bit of context, and yes, data. I am, after all, from the University of Chicago, and thank you to President Alvisados for being here, um, to help ground us in some hard truths, but also some reason for optimism. Let me start by zooming out to an international comparison. This is the homicide rate in the United States and in several other high-income or so-called developed nations. The US, this is US exceptionalism and not in a good way. This shows you the part of the homicide rate that is driven by guns. What you can see is the gun, homicide, gun homicides drive almost all of the difference in our rate of lethal violence. This is important to understand because gun crime actually accounts for about, uh, only about 0.2% of overall crime in the United States, but over 70% of the social harm that comes from crime. The dominant response to our crime crisis in the US, which as I mentioned, really is a gun violence crisis, has been to rely heavily on the criminal justice system. Tragically, black men have borne a disproportionate dual burden of gun violence and of the harms that come from our response to gun violence. Now I wanna focus on, sorry, now I wanna focus on the three largest US cities, LA, New York, and Chicago. Over most of our history, we've had nearly identical homicide trends. That is no longer true. This is both bad news, clearly, but also it should give us some reason for optimism. Things can change for the better and quickly. We need not accept violent crime as somehow like the weather, something we ju that just happens out of our control. But to add to the challenge, here in Chicago, we've actually seen a widening in the safety gap. We spend a lot of time talking about income inequality and I would argue not nearly enough time on something even more fundamental, the inequality in basic safety. For white Chicagoans, even the worst year in recent years, 2020, was safer than the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic. 
For Latinx Chicagoans, they are also safer than they were then. For black Chicagoans, 2020 was the most dangerous year on record. The talk about gun violence often leads to a focus on root causes. Root causes like racism, segregation, and poverty are without question important to address. But we must not lose sight of the fact that the causal arrow actually goes in the other direction too. In some ways, gun violence itself is a root cause. Um, it, it contributes to entrenching other root causes. Improving social mobility through education or economic development in Chicago runs into a massive headwind of persistent gun violence. Just to offer one concrete example, my crime lab affiliate and Princeton sociologist, uh, Pat Sharkey, found that a child exposed to gun violence on their block tests in school as though they are two years behind in the weeks following that incident. This is Melody Elementary School in West Garfield Park. Just think about the ripple effect that this has on the children going to that school, and for our city, and for our nation. Much of the work to address gun violence uh, in the immediate term has fallen on the shoulders of two sectors, police and community violence uh, intervention organizations. My organization recently launched the Community Safety Leadership Academies to make a big national push to invest in the management and leadership or the human capital of these sectors. The private sector invests literally billions of dollars into leadership and management of mid-level managers to get more ROI out of its workforce. It's not hyperbole to say that in most US cities, almost no investments are made in leadership and management for these two sectors, despite the fact that life and liberty are literally their bottom line. In today's conversation, we'll get into the evidence around how to help these two sectors increase their impact, and in the case of community violence intervention, what it would take to actually scale it. If police and CVI are the tip of the spear, none of us want to live in a world where we need to deploy a police officer or a CVI worker on every corner. These, there are a number of other levers that we can pull. I'm so pleased uh, that many are called out in the Civic Committee's Public Safety Task Force report, which we'll talk about today. I also want to commend Discover for taking a place and people-based approach in locating their new call center in uh, the Chatham neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. And I also want to highlight the encouraging evidence that employment strategies really can help improve safety. Again, we'll delve more into this in a moment. Before uh, us today is the pressing and urgent question of what the long-term future of our city and the people in it will be, and what role will each of us play? We are at an inflection point with much opportunity ahead, with a new mayor, new leadership at, for the Civic Committee's Public Safety Task Force, and Chicago continues to be at the forefront for innovation and generating evidence in public safety. But will we act on that evidence? Will we take it to scale? Answers to these questions will determine which direction we go. I'm gonna go ahead and start with my first question for our new co-chairs, if that's okay. I'd like to ask Mark and uh, Eric to talk a little bit about the, the task force's um, recommendations and kind of walk us through how you landed on the recommendations that you did and, and what the Civic Committee is gonna be doing to really engage in public safety and bring the, the rest of the business community along. Great, um, thanks, Rosanna. Um, first of all, I just wanna start off with a um, moment of gratitude for all of you uh, the showing today is actually evidence that uh, this is a really critical issue for so many leaders in Chicago. Um, if I distributed, of course you can see for yourself, but the invite list and, and those who replied and those who are here, it's stunning. And it's inspiring to me, it's what, it's what gives me the energy and, and the motivation to, to keep going. I also wanna say um, deep gratitude to Eric, Garion, and Arnie to Jenny and David uh, for hosting. Um, we're all extraordinarily committed um, and, and really serious about this effort. Um, so I'm gonna lead off, um, but quickly turn it over to Eric and we, we'll, we'll sort of tag team this uh, as we plan to do our co-chairmanship. Um, I'm blessed with, a, with the best co-chair anyone could possibly ask for. Um, this is ba basically what we, what we refer to as the house, um, the house of the task force. And uh, the good news is, even if you can't read it on, um, on the screen, which is not, oh, there it is, um, you do have a, a printed copy at your table, and that is absolutely legible. Um, good move to whoever decided to put those on the table. Um, 
so basically, I'm not gonna actually read off of this card, but what it does cover is what the, what the ultimate vision is. That's the, that's the roof part of the house. Um, what some of the, the, the critical, I guess, markers might be, might look like over the next five to 10 years with respect to homicides and gun violence, although I'm gonna come back to that point in a second. Um, and then the five pillars, and the five pillars are really what um, Eric and I wanna cover right now. The first one is to partner and scale neighborhood community violence intervention efforts. So first and foremost, what is community violence intervention? As Rosanna just covered, vi gun violence and homicides are not um, a thing unto themselves. They're, you have to understand what's happening in context of the community. And you can't do that without being in the community. So the first, uh, the first thing I would say about CVI, about community violence intervention, is that it is a explicit recognition that this is an ecosystem uh, problem that needs to be addressed in an ecosystem kind of way, highly coordinated across community-based organizations, the community itself critical, the police force, government, and business. Those are the key constituents that need to be engaged in addressing public safety. And public safety should not be defined as simply the reduction of gun violence and, and homicide. It should be thought of as the health of the community because you're trying to elevate both uh, the economic security that comes from a vibrant community and the well-being of the citizens. So what some of the critical uh, factors are that CVI organizations, CVI organizations like CRED, like Ready, like CP4P um, are doing, like UCAN, um, supported, by the way, for the Partnership for Safe and uh, Peaceful Communities, PSPC, which has been in existence for a long time and dedicated a lot of effort to this. So these are not new efforts, is outreach. You have to be on the blocks and walking the blocks to engage in the community. That's number one. Number two, case management. You've got a lot of uh, people who are either justice involved or at risk of being uh, pulled into violence uh, that is committing violence or frankly at high risk of being victims of, of violence, uh, gun violence in particular. Third is behavioral health, critically important. Fourth is education and how that factors into um, building the, the recipe for a foundation for the future and fifth which is gonna be number two on our list, I'll come to that now, is jobs, employment. So you have to address those various elements and what CVI organizations do is, a, is they address that in a coordinated way. It's not easy. The good news is we have existing organizations who've been at it for a long time, who've learned a lot. I'm gonna ask, actually, Arnie will talk about this in, in a few minutes. There's nobody on the stage who knows the history of this better than he does. And there's some really encouraging, there's no silver bullet here, by the way. This is a test and learn and an experimental, experimentation driven uh, journey that we're on, but he will talk a little bit about North Lawndale and some of the data that we've seen out of North Lawndale, which is encouraging. Um, let's turn to employment, that's pillar two. We look to try to uh, elevate the uh, number of people who are coming through CVI programs, we're referring to them as CVI graduates, to get to a run rate of 2,000 per year that can be employed. So our call to action, which we'll talk about at the end, is for every organization, whether you're a corporation, a university, a hospital system, a not-for-profit, it sort of doesn't, government uh, organization doesn't matter, to find initially five to 10 positions into which you could hire CVI graduates. Uh, I'm proud to say that, that Hyatt has made our first offer of, of employment to a CVI graduate from CP4P. Um, still completing background check at this point, but I expect that that is going to be completed uh, successfully. And I will I'd be very happy to be re reporting to you about how that individual is doing, Nicholas is his name. Um, once he's had some experience on the job at the High Regency McCormick Place. Um, but every, everyone in this room can be a part of that, and that's um, a second critical dimension to this. And I'll turn it to Eric for uh, Pillar 3. Great. 
Good afternoon, and, and thanks to Mark and to uh, the other uh, esteemed panelists uh, for the opportunity to have this uh, rich discussion uh, this afternoon. As Mark has explained, um, it's really uh, one of the true treasures of Chicago to have the public-private partnership that allows this city to accomplish great things. That's what we have historically stood for. And so the comprehensive approach that we have tried to uh, develop is to allow us to address not only the acute issues, but also the underlying issues. And so pillar number three is part of that comprehensive approach, and it includes the important aspect of policing. And what we have focused on as the Civic Committee, uh, first and foremost, is to make sure that we can work collaboratively with our new Chief of Police, uh, Larry Snelling, um, to allow him to have the opportunity to obviously assess the important needs. But in preparation for that, over the last several months, as our task force was assembled uh, in October of 2022, we began to think about some of the important issues that we see ahead. Uh, first and foremost is thinking about the importance of restoring community engagement and trust. The most important way for us to do that is to make sure that we can have timely enforcement of the consent decree, uh, which was the court ordered agreement that allows us to think about how we focus on providing our police officers with the support, the training and the development that's essential, but also having the accountability that is important for our communities to have the trust and the local police department. It's also essential for the business community to be able to provide the resources that will be needed through funding, uh, through the talent and the people that we can provide, uh, and the expertise that we can help. Uh, for instance, uh, being able to provide the type of uh, consultative uh, work around workforce optimization for the police department so that they can fully understand what their needs are in each local community uh, based on the specific needs, again, in collaboration with the communities. I think the last aspect also that we're focused on is ways that we can invest in technology. Technology is a huge opportunity for us to be able to support the local precincts to make sure that they have the state-of-the-art technology available to them to address the crime in the community. And then lastly, as Rosanna shared some of the very alarming stats that we see around issues around gun violence, it's very important as a task force that we support this, the existing gun laws that are in place and that we also stand against those manufacturers, uh, gun manufacturers that are rogue and are not adhering to the laws that are on the books because we recognize that that is a huge issue that we face in terms of guns being in the hands of criminals here in the city. So with that, I'll turn it back to, to Mark to go through Pillar 4. Thanks. Um, so Pillar 4 is another workforce-related uh, pillar. It relates to a, a broader mandate with respect to employment of uh, individuals who are living in underserved communities. Rosanna mentioned in passing the extraordinary uh, success and effort, effort initially and then ultimately success that Discover has had in Chatham, opening um, a a guest, a customer service center there, employing a thousand people, over 90% of whom live within a five mile radius of that location. And it is now one of the top performing guest customer service centers in the country for Discover. It's extraordinary. So for anybody who has gotten too distracted with the fact that the Whole Foods at 53rd and uh, Halstead shut down, um, be aware that there are other more substantive and frankly higher employee base kinds of facilities that are able to be located in some of these underserved communities. So one is employing those uh, in these underserved communities in the south and west side which have the highest unemployment rates in the city locally but also in jobs and in our case at Hyde Hotels in our hotels many of which are in and around the loop or uh, towards O'Hare. And so it's, it's really a community effort, and we, we intend to ramp that so that we can employ up to 20,000 such individuals over the next five years. Pillar five, and I'm, I'm thankful to see two of our uh, uh, task force members that are here with us who chair Pillar five, Eileen Mitchell from AT&T and Curtis Reed uh, from J.P. Morgan Chase, um, is really focused on economic development. And what we've tried to do is to take a look at all 77 communities around Chicago uh, narrow that down to roughly 21 communities that are really at the highest levels of issues around crime that align with our focus for the Public Safety Task Force, but also with the Invest Southwest initiative. 
And from that group of 21, we selected six communities that we are identifying as being our top priority for where we want to focus ways that we can make sure that we're providing access to capital and the funding and the resources that will be needed to provide the economic development and those communities that have been for far too long underinvested in. The communities that we've identified uh, on, for a pre preliminary basis are Auburn Gresham, Austin, uh, New City. Uh, we also have selected South Lawndale and South Shore uh, and Washington Park. Um, we selected those communities not only because of the rate of crime, uh, and in some cases they may not actually represent the highest rate of crime, but those six communities actually have an economic infrastructure that we believe will allow us to go in and to mobilize the, the, the structures that are there, not only in terms of the local businesses, but also the organizations that are on the ground, and the social services that will also be important for wraparound uh, services in order for us to bring back economic vitality to those communities. Fundamentally, we believe that this is an issue that we have to address, that we have to be intentional around. There's no reason why the zip code that a child is born in should determine his or her success. And the safety, the public safety aspect is one that we believe requires that sort of comprehensive approach for us to make sure that the business community can lean in and provide that support that will be absolutely critical to the success of this initiative. Great, thank you both for um, describing that initiative. And I really do think it's such a nice mix of both those immediate impacts uh, things that can uh, affect public safety, but also the longer term investments to really start to get at the root causes. So kudos to, to the Civic Committee. Um, Deputy Mayor Gatewood, I guess congratulations uh, on your new role. Uh, I think it's fair yes. to say, yes, exactly. Um, I think it's fair to say we have a room full of people willing to offer their time, treasure, and talent to make the city safe and vibrant for all residents, um, both present and future. We want a growing population. Um, and I know so many others who aren't here today feel the same way. So I'd love to have you start to um, describe your administration's approach. And I'd like you to start with what are you going to do on the sort of near-term, immediate um, front. Uh, and then we'll talk more about the sort of longer-term kind of root cause strategies so that we can kind of understand the difference between the sort of complementary approaches. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for the question. Thank you for everybody who's here today. Um, when we talk about some of our near-term work, you see this partnership here. But what we've done from the administration standpoint is for the first time ever, we've created a community safety cabinet. I see my buddy Kim Meyer over there, who's a big part of that, where we are taking every single city agency in the city of Chicago to sit down and think about the role that we all play in safety. Not just one, where we have historically looked at CPD for safety, or we've historically looked at the fire department. What's the role the business departments can play? What's the role that the parks department can play in safety? So we have a comprehensive approach. We all understand that every single person in this room, whether you live in the city, regardless of who you voted for, our conversation, is always about safety. Everybody cares about safety, so understanding that that is all of our role to attract people who believe in safety and really work towards those goals. So some of the short-term work that we've continued to do is we've continued investments, right, in community violence intervention, continue our partnerships with economic development, and we've tried to create stronger relationships with the business community. Um, and we do that on a regular basis, not only from the business community, but also strengthening our relationships with the faith community, youth organizations, um, and many other organizations around the city, because we all play that role. And what we also understand is you can't create community safety without it being community led. We can say things here, but from a community perspective, people who actually live on those blocks can tell you what those issues are. They are the experts. All right, you lean in on the expertise and you partner with them. So that's something we've been doing continuously. You know, we have consistent conversations with the Chicago Police Department on the approaches that they're taking to safety and also understanding that it's not only their responsibility. You've often heard conversations where you'll hear CPD and others say they're asked to do too much. So it's our responsibility to figure out how to take some of that load off of them and create that safer Chicago that we all want. Great, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, Arnie, I, I wanna say that I think that Mark did an amazing job describing what CVI is, uh, so kudos to you. But I'd love for you to maybe elaborate on his definition, his description of it, but also 
tell us why you decided you could have gone and made a ton of money in the private sector after the career you've had and you've devoted yourself to really working on community violence intervention here in Chicago. So can you tell us why you did that? And also, I want to have a real conversation. What are some of the hard lessons you've learned? I, I don't want to just tell the stories of the successes. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't know if I could have made a ton of money, but I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I may miss those calls, but no, I'm, 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 doing, ex <laughs> I, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And for, this work for all of us is just real personal. And um, going back to being a teenager in Chicago, playing basketball, lost friends who protected me and gave me safe passage out of neighborhoods. That, I think, shapes you and scars you in some ways that are a little bit difficult to talk about. Um, fast forward to leading the Chicago Public Schools for seven and a half years. Happy to talk about successes at another lunch if we want to do that. But on my watch during my seven and a half years, on average, we had a, a child, a student killed every two weeks due to gun violence. It was a devastating rate of loss. And it's by far the hardest part of my job was meeting those families 99% of the time after they just lost their young son or daughter. And everything else, academic achievement, labor management, budgets, operations, all that was way easier than dealing with that. It got progressively harder. And very naively, when our family left to go to D.C. 2000, end of 2008, I really thought Chicago was at rock bottom. I thought it couldn't get worse. And unfortunately, it got a lot worse in the seven years we were gone. So for me, coming home, <laughs> city that's given me every opportunity. This just felt like the crisis facing the city. and didn't feel like it was being addressed. And just to add a little bit to, to the stats that, that Rosanna talked about earlier, Chicago's about six, more, six times more violent than New York. We're about three to four times violent, more violent than LA. We have about 200 more homicides each year than any other city in America. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. And we have to have a collective sense of urgency. We have to acknowledge the crisis. We have to acknowledge how broken it is. And then collectively, none of this, this work does nothing if it doesn't humble you. The, the lessons are extraordinarily difficult. But if we work together, I'm convinced we have a chance over the next three, four, five years to dramatically, not incrementally, not incrementally dramatically reduce violence. So how do, you, how do you reduce shootings? The most important thing you can do is try and stop the next shooting. And a huge amount of violence in Chicago, unfortunately, is driven by retaliation, because very few homicides get solved. The communities where we work on the south and west sides, about 10 to 11 percent of homicides get solved. So that means you literally have an 89, 90, 91 percent chance of getting away with murder. And if you just shoot somebody and don't kill them, basically none of that gets solved. So police rebuilding trust is critically important long term. The mayor picked the perfect person to lead the police department, Larry Snelling. I think he's going to be fantastic. But that's going to take some time. He can't do it by himself. We have to help him. So while we police try and rebuild trust in the community and actually solve crimes so you don't have street justice, it's critically important that we intervene with those young men and women. And we can call them at risk. We can call them at promise. I don't like to get into academic debates. They're just acutely <laughs> more likely to be shot than most of us in this room. Northwestern's done an evaluation of young men we serve. They say on average they're 3,000 times more likely to be shot than the average Chicago resident. And the level of stress and trauma that they're dealing with every single day is extraordinary. Um, Jeremy Jordan, one of our guys in the back, he was first shot at, at 13. Joseph Thomas is back here. He was first shot at, at 10. When those things happen, it changes how you view the world. It changes how you move, how you act. And so working with those young men, young women, we're down to 13-year-olds now, call them at risk, call them at promise, call them whatever you want. And credit is just one small part of this. We have about two dozen amazing partners around Chicago we, we work with. So I really don't want to even talk about cred. Collectively, we have to serve those men, women, and teens most acutely at risk of shooting or being shot, help them heal from trauma, help them get their high school diplomas, give them a life coach, and ultimately the jobs piece is hugely important because I can't ask people to put down the guns if they don't have a job to go to. Jeremy Jordan's doing great because DLA Piper and Rich Kowitter has hired him and a couple of other, our, a couple other of our alums. If that wasn't possible, then again, we're selling false hope and we're part of the problem. So collectively, if we can create a pipeline that the business community is willing to hire, um, and we have to get to real numbers fast. And I'll be very clear, it's not hiring someone right off the block or right out of Cook County Jail, but it's those alumni that Mark talked about out of our collective programs. Then we have a chance to do something radically different as we go forward.
All right, I'm going to ask you another question. Um, can you talk about, there's uh, often when we talk about community violence intervention, it's sort of a either CVI or police. There tends to be a, yeah. a narrative often that is like pitting the two sectors against each other. And I'd love for your thoughts on what it should actually look like in practice and what you see happening in Chicago. Are you yes. hopeful that there can be more collaboration? Well, I, have, I have strong opinions on this. So, uh, we desperately need the police to be successful. Somehow people think I'm like the anti-police guy. And I just want to be very, very honest. I can make a pretty good case, and I hate to say this, that the biggest driver of violence in Chicago right now is police ineffectiveness. It's because nothing gets solved that we have all of this retaliation. Jeremy Jordan I met in Cook County Jail because his brother got shot and paralyzed and that didn't get investigated. And I apologize for being a little bit emotional. So there's a disrespect for what happens. And so we desperately want the police to be effective. We want them to solve homicide. No one wants to go to jail for 30, 40, 50 years. That's no badge of honor. If there were deterrence, that would make our job a hell of a lot easier. It's because there are you know, almost no deterrence now that you have sort of a, uh, you know, everyone, they call it getting your lick back. You got to get your lick back because you feel disrespected. I feel no one cares about your loved one. Um, that's when we have to come in. So having the police be effective, and quite frankly, I think we have a chance with, with uh, Larry Snellian that we have not had for years now. Um, that's going to take time, but having the police rebuild trust and solve crimes, we desperately need that. Having said that, our only intervention can't be locking people up and incarcerating them. We want to give people a chance to do something different. And historically, we've had an you know, incarceration-only strategy, and no one got locked up. So it was like beyond ineffective as part of the problem. But if we can give people an off-ramp, give them a chance to do something different, um, then we don't have to just you know, uh, you know, rely on a strategy that's been failed. So there is no conflict there. We need both. We need to be accountable for our results and hold ourselves accountable in these transparent data. We need the police to actually solve homicides. And if we're both holding up our side of the bargain, then again, not 10 years from now, but next two, three, four years, you'll see the communities most impacted by gun violence become dramatically safer. Great. I just want to acknowledge when you talked about police ineffectiveness, if you think about the budget for the police department, it's probably between two and three billion dollars, depending on how you calculate it. If we could make the police department 10% more effective, think about what that would mean. You know, philanthropy is working hard to invest millions of dollars, but when we make a two billion dollar or nine billion when we're talking about the school system, get more ROI, we're talking about massive population level impact. So I think it's an important thing to acknowledge. Um, Deputy Mayor Gatewood, I'd love to have you talk about what you guys were looking for, what the administration was looking for in its new superintendent, and is the administration open to hearing his perspective on key issues in policing, even if they're different than ones uh, that were uh, elaborated on during the campaign? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, of course we are, right? We, we picked Superintendent Snelling for a reason. Um, his deep ties to community. Um, you know, what's interesting, uh, Arnie, to your point, you know, when you look at uh, Superintendent Snelling's references, they're from the CVI community. So Superintendent Snelling understands the impact and the importance of collaboration. Um, you know, we, we talk about the work that the Community Commission did with deep community involvement in helping select the superintendent. Not only are we open to having discussions with people who may not agree with the approach that the administration has taken, but we welcome it, right? Like the mayor was here at the Economic Club a couple of weeks ago, right? And we continue to have conversations with everybody. Not only are we going to support the incoming superintendent and the work that he's doing and really invested in his leadership, but we wanna make sure we are able to offer supports around him, right? Again, because we understand consistently, and the message has been the same, that we are asking police to do too much. So how do we make sure we layer our approaches and our supports from other entities in government, our partnerships at the county level, at the state level, at the federal level, and then thinking about how we layer with the community-based organizations. So there is no strife at all. We, we par partner on a regular basis, talk almost every day. Honestly, I may have talked to Larry Schneller more than I talked to my wife as of late. So <laughs> there's, not, there's not an issue with us. We consistently work together because we know our ultimate goal is to make the city safer. We want to make this the safest city in the country, and we can only do that through collaboration. 
Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for both of the CEOs here. Um, I'd love for you both to talk about how Chicago's public safety, both environment but also reputation, has had an impact on your companies, your businesses, um, and kind of, I assume it's partly why you're being, getting involved in this, but I'd love for you to maybe paint a little bit of a picture of what the impact has been when you go out trying to recruit people, bring people to Chicago. How does that affect your work? So whoever wants to take it first. Um, so from my perspective, um, and I'll, I'll be a little bit more narrowly focused here given the business that I'm in, but um, the uh, travel and hospitality sector in Chicago, especially given the enormity of the convention business that comes through McCormick Place, is in excess of $2 billion a year of GDP for the, for the city. So um, the number one, uh, someone was asking me earlier about um, uh, group bookings into Chicago and we, we continue to see group bookings in, into Chicago. Um, the, what I would say is the number, we track this, the number one question in every single case in the past year has been about public safety and about how, what steps we in within our hotels and what McCormick Place has been doing to elevate safety. So it is on everyone's mind. And I know that um, frankly, it gets amplified in all the worst ways and I apologize for any members of the press uh, in, in the room, but uh, sometimes the, the most, uh, I don't know, popular or uh, sensationalist thing you can put on the cover is about shootings and killings. And that's actually what people think of when they think of Chicago as a consequence of that. I think that um, our, our, our job here is to turn that narrative on its head and start talking about how many people we've been able to employ and how successfully um, the income levels and the opportunities that we are seeing elevate in the underserved communities, um, some of those su success stories. By the way, in addition to Discover, ITW is now um, uh, active in building out some manufacturing facilities in Austin. So we're talking about going into some of the, some of the most affected uh, communities with the highest at-risk populations and setting up businesses. So those are the things that I, I hope make it to the headlines. But uh, it, is, it, is, it has an impact, there's no question about it. I think Eric actually is better qualified to talk about the, the community effort because you led the way in getting BMO into Austin as well, so. No, it's an important issue for us uh, as we think about our mission at BMO, uh, which we call it uh, to boldly grow the good and business and life. And it's directly tied to how we think about promoting a thriving economy. Uh, the public safety issue has a huge impact on us here economically. It has a huge impact us, on us on the lives of, of our children, our families, our employees, our ability to recruit top talent. And so what we've tried to do is to lean in and to make sure that we can do that from a philanthropic uh, way. Uh, when uh, we had our, the launch of Invest Southwest, uh, BMO stepped up with a $10 million uh, investment uh, to support the Austin community. And as Mark mentioned, we were proud to partner with ITW, who's putting in a manufacturing facility in Austin, and BMO's gonna put in a branch, and a new Aspire Center, which was an abandoned school that had been left vacant for 10 years. Uh, the impact that that had on that community was huge. Um, we've also tried to support with direct investment dollars to build Chicago. Uh, another great organization similar to CRED that's doing work in the Austin community uh, to help combat uh, violence prevention. Uh, we've done a $10 million gift to uh, Rush University Hospital to stand up uh, the first health equity institute. Um, but I think more fundamental to that is thinking about how we serve as a bank and how we deepen the impact. And so uh, several years ago in 2020, uh, during the height of the pandemic, we launched uh, BMO Empower, which was a $5 billion, five-year commitment to providing increased access to capital to black, Latino, and women-owned businesses and communities. We thought that it would take us five years to deploy that, uh, but it turned out that the need was so great uh, that we did that in just two years. And so most recently, we increased our commitment to 40, over $40 billion using that same framework of supporting small businesses, uh, bringing in supplier diversity as part of our program and also our philanthropic efforts. 
But it's not just BMO. Uh, I'm proud to know that here in Chicago, we have a vibrant financial services community. And so it's exciting to see what Discover is doing in Chatham, creating a call center that currently employs over 500 people and will employ up to 1,000 people in that local community. Um, it's exciting to see what PNC is doing in terms of their commitments. And my friend Scott Swanson, is, who is here, it's exciting to see what J.P. Morgan Chase is doing. It's exciting to see what Loop Capital is doing in terms of community development and the projects that they're leading. But together, we are able to bring our resources in a way that we're no longer competitors. We're able to work together to provide access to capital for community development that will help to make Chicago a national model of what can work and what makes sense for us for transformative change. Great, thanks for that. And I just wanna mention that Chicago, you're right, does get so much attention for all of the wrong reasons. And I think one of the things that, uh, that I wish the members of the press did a better job of understanding is we're the third largest city, so our homicide numbers are higher, but our homicide rate, we're in the middle of the pack for US cities. And so I think Chicago also doesn't get nearly enough attention for the positive work that's happening, the innovation that's happening. We really are a model that other cities look to uh, in so many spaces. And so I do hope that members of the press can do a better job of understanding the difference between rates and numbers and also telling the story of the innovation that's happening here that other cities are emulating. Um, so Arnie, I'm gonna ask you sort of two questions um, packed into one. Um, I want you to sort of talk, talk us through what kind of resources uh, are needed if we really are going to scale CVI uh, for Chicago. But I also want you to touch on another, um, I think, really important topic that I don't think gets nearly enough attention. So, you know, you were at CPS uh, before becoming uh, education secretary for Obama. Um, my team at the Education Lab conservatively estimates that there are about 25 to 30,000 school-aged children in Chicago who are no longer attending school and don't have a high school diploma. And then when we look at the data on the youth who do become victims of gun violence, well over 90% of them were no longer engaged in school. Um, so what should we be doing? You can wear your hat as former CPS CEO or philanthropist or direct service provider um, to get public education, uh, get these young people the public education that they're legally entitled to, um, to really try to improve outcomes. So uh, don't want to throw too many numbers at you, but basically 15 neighborhoods in Chicago produce 70, 75 percent of the violence in Chicago. And unfortunately, 75, 80 percent of those being shot are young black men, 18 to 24. So we have to focus, and again, all the resources and rooms like this across Chicago, the fact that we can't go to scale in 15 neighborhoods, for me, is sort of mind-boggling. We have to be able to do that. Um, we've seen a real growth in the community violence intervention team, and it's really a public health approach. Um, but collectively, we're serving maybe 10, 15 percent of those, again, who, who, who need those kinds of services. So we have to scale. Philanthropy has been extraordinarily helpful. Uh, public sector is st starting to step up. But we've got to think over the next couple of years how we go from three neighborhoods to five to eight to 12 to 15 and reach a critical mass, 60, 70 percent of those, of those who most need the services. Um, this is a business group, so ROI. Um, every homicide in real cost costs our city about a million dollars. Forget lost tourism, forget you know, lost you know, black reverse migration back down south. CPS has lost 20% of its population, all those other things. Every homicide costs about a, a, a million dollars a city. When you talk about the wraparound services for individuals, life coaches, clinicians, job coach, education tutor, that's about $20,000. So if you can take one person <laughs> wrap them with those services, have them transition to a job later, that costs you about $20,000. $20, if that prevents a homicide, that's a 50 to one ROI. You guys are a lot better in business than me, but that, that's a pretty good ROI. Um, every bed in Cook County Jail is about 60 grand per year. So do we want to invest and give people, a, again, a path out or not? And I think you know, for the first time, we've been at this seven years, I have a, a sense of hope, a sense of optimism that we can start to scale and work together. Um, for me, it's so important we work at scale in neighborhoods because the work that we did historically with credit is what I call individual transformation. But if you're just doing that and you're not changing the violence dynamics in the neighborhood, then you still have way too many bullets flying. And very tragically, we've lost way too many of our alumni who are doing well, but the community hasn't changed. And so we have to raise our aspirations from individual transformation, which is powerful, it's going to be hard of our work, to neighborhood violence suppression. Um, we're early on in North Lawndale that, that Mark talked about. Um, 
working with a couple partners. We thought we were doing a good job there, serving about you know, 200 folks. USC came back and said, well, it's probably 1,250 that you need to be serving, so we weren't even in the game. So working with a couple great partners, um, last year we saw more than a 40, about a 40% reduction in violence. This year has been more rocky, but I don't want to knock on wood, I don't want to jinx us, but the numbers are getting progressively better. In this, this last month, we've seen nothing there in North Londo. We recently put in place another uh, non-aggression agreement there. So we have to start to scale, and collectively, public sector, private sector, philanthropy has been amazing. Um, Jim Crown's family, Crown Family Foundation has been fantastic in North Lawndale. Sudling Jin Foundation has set, stepped up. They're going to be very helpful. Folks are investing there. On, so jumping to your second question, on CPS, and I'll, I'll get to a, a couple things. Um, what's happening to our kids in our communities is un, unprecedented. And what I think, and this is not a critique of CPS at all, Traditional social workers, traditional counselors aren't trained to deal with this level of trauma. And we need to create a new job, and we're talking to CPS about this. It's complicated. Many of our best job coaches, life coaches, Sherman Scarlax in the back, he's one of ours, many of them have criminal backgrounds. And CPS, I understand why, has restrictions on that, but you're losing the talent you need. I always say the people closest to the problem actually have the best solutions, and we're locking that talent out. So to find those kids who aren't safe, to find those kids who are missing school, to intervene in conflicts, not just in high schools, but in elementary schools, we need to call it a, a life coach like we have at our sites. We need to create a new job description, job title, to work with those kids most acutely at risk. And unfortunately, too often I meet with the families after they've lost their young son or daughter. When you look at their background, the number of schools that, that bounce to, and all the different issues, I don't want to say it's inevitable that they are going to be killed, but they were at extraordinary risk, and we have to intervene much earlier. I want to stem the pipeline of young people coming into programs like ours. And so getting to those younger kids starting 10, 11, 12, 13 is critically important. Great. We're really, really short on time, so I'm going to ask the last question to uh, Deputy Mayor Gatewood. Um, I want to editorialize a little bit and say that I think one of Chicago's challenges, um, especially around public safety, has been the whole being less than the sum of its parts. Lots of separate efforts, separate efforts excuse me, um, some inside government, some driven by philanthropy, some from the private sector, some from academia, and some from nonprofits. Um, to that end, the Civic Committee is calling for a one-table approach, um, which we heard about. Uh, I'd love to kind of get your sense of the new administration's thinking about one table versus let a thousand flowers bloom, or kind of how you're thinking about that. And in, in two minutes, we will start taking questions from the audience. Cool. First of all, flowers are nice, right? Um, but honestly... <laughs> Rosanna is. <laughs> yeah, look at that. How about that? What a coinky dink. Yeah. So honestly, we've been building with partnership in the Civic Committee, with partnership with the business, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, with partnership with the faith community, the uh, research community, all around the board, approaching, uh, taking our approach to building out plans to address the root causes of violence. We created this Office of Community Safety with a different approach. Historically, the office, when it was the Office of Public Safety, was very reactionary. We've been very intentional about building a comprehensive approach we have very similar pillars where theirs align with ours, but we are also approaching not just from the community violence intervention perspective, we're also looking at education, healthcare, economic upward mobility, we're looking at community environment, we're looking at so many different areas and we're combining all these players to the table. We may, I think we have nine working groups going right now, all moving towards the same direction with a lot of the players who are in the room are part of those. So we're moving in that direction to create that ultimate goal where we can create that safety together comprehensively. The ultimate goal is always to create a safer city for all of us, and we do that through collaboration. Uh, we may have 300 folks come through City Hall every week to build on safety issues, and they are representing all communities around the city from the nonprofit space. We have young folks helping guide us, really impressing us on what we're doing on the budget, and also really thinking about how we collaborate with our partners across the board. So. The ultimate goal is to always break down silos because silos don't work. You can talk to anybody in any sector. The same issues you're having in economics are the same issues you're having in healthcare, are the same issues you're having in violence. So let's break down those silos and work together. And this is one of the big steps today. One of the big public steps because we already been working Perfect. together. Perfect. We're at exactly zero. Well done. Efficiency. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Um, so we're going to start taking questions, I believe, from the audience. I think there's somebody who is going to be walking around with a green. I can't really see. 
um, oh, green, so if, if the audience has questions, and while we're c getting questions from the audience, the question I didn't get to ask the panel that I want you to work into one of your answers is what can the business community do to support this work? How can uh, the business community be more engaged with the new administration, with CRED, and with the civic committee's new efforts? So um, any, qu I see some hands, or I saw some hands. Uh, good afternoon, George Jordan uh, with Oxford Hotels and Resorts. Um, I, I've heard a lot of great talk, but I haven't heard anybody mention drugs. I haven't heard anybody mention the no snitch policy on the west side and south side. And I haven't heard anybody mention uh, the old notion in New York, and I'm not saying we should emulate it, broken windows. And more specifically, the uh, what do they call it, where they're spinning their, their wheels in the intersections and scaring the hell out of the locals. So I was just wondering if you could, if any one of you would address those three topics because I think they're hand in glove. I'll, I'll try and take a couple, and these are all complicated issues. So um, drug addiction is a real issue, but historically folks are making a lot of money on the streets selling drugs, and for all kinds of reasons, those economies of scale have gone away. So very few people are making money. When young people come into our program, we pay them a small stipend. I always ask, are you taking a pay cut or pay increase to come work with us? Half the folks are taking a pay, uh, uh, pay increase to come work with us. And those that are making a little bit of money on the streets, it's fast money, it's not stable, it's all kinds of risk. And so there's a myth that everyone's getting rich out there. Um, that's, really, that's really not true. Um, I would challenge you on the no snitch stuff. I know three people who have talked to the police who have been killed, unfortunately. And that, you know, that gets around. Um, often things don't get investigated. Um, things don't get followed up. Um, Jeremy Jordan's brother was paralyzed. There was no investigation. And so I just want to be very clear here. There's no blanket, no snitch policy. Um, people don't feel safe. They don't feel safe. There isn't, a, there isn't trust there. I mean, this is a minor detail, but the witness protection program, I don't know where that went. But if you testify and, and you get killed, and again, I literally know of three folks who have done that, that's the opposite of a no snitch policy. They're, they're sacrificing their life trying to pursue justice, and that doesn't happen. So I just, there's a complexity here that we need to really talk about. Um, and some of those myths are some of the things that historically were true. There may be a very small set of folks getting rich selling drugs now. Um, we don't run across them. We don't, we don't see that. Can I just add one thing to, uh, on the, you know, the west side really is sort of our ground zero for our overdose crisis. Um, we have far more overdose deaths than we do um, gun violence deaths, and I, I want to acknowledge some important work that's being done by uh, community organization thresholds and the Chicago Police Department to really try to put police back in the job of focusing on violent crime. And, and I really do echo what Arnie said, that when we read the narratives of homicides in Chicago, it, it's much fewer are tied to the drug markets than, than I think the public narrative would have you believe. But this is an effort to really connect individuals that police are coming into contact with and connect them to services. And we're seeing incredible successes of people taking up treatment and getting the help that they need and then freeing up officer time to focus on the violence. So I think there are these really positive examples. Um, and then I just think on the question about New York and broken windows, I think there's a lot of sort of, there's, Broken windows in theory and broken windows in practice were two different things. In New York, they use, they use it as a pretext to go after gun violence. Um, and so I think there are certainly some lessons from New York. I think they have, they've professionalized their police department. They invest a lot more in their human capital. They've been much more data-driven in investing in non-police responses to public safety. So I do think there are some lessons from New York um, that we can be looking at. Um, and I think there are lessons from Chicago that, that New York can be looking at as well. So anybody? else want to respond to, to the question? Do you? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, so, you know, you highlighted uh, thresholds. Marquez Shog and his team have done incredible work, but also lifting up the work of CPD, but also the CDPH, yeah. right? So you have an opioid response crisis team that deals with crisis over on the west side where you see those overdose. And as Rosanna said, you know, often we see in the media on Monday morning, you hear about murders in the city, right? But we have an opioid crisis that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So. Ultimately, right, one of the ultimate things that we can always do is look for more areas in partnership, more areas of collaboration, because these problems that we're facing, we're not going to be able to get out of them alone. So I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to work with you and your team so we can really think about how we drive safety throughout the city. Great. Question over here. Uh, hi, Jim Slama. Um, I heard you starting to talk about New York. 
which I appreciate, and the important use of data. Also, your chart showing kind of like crime in New York and LA plummeting and Chicago going up. Uh, what else can we learn, especially also from LA? Clearly, uh, they learned some lessons as well, and I'd just love to hear more about that, and also how data can most effectively be used to combat crime. I'm gonna let Arnie get the first crack at that one. So, two of the leaders on my team in Chicago Craig, we actually recruited from LA because they actually effectively reduced the violence there. And it's, it's interesting, um, a, a few different lessons. One is taking sort of the CBI work to scale. Uh, second, we talked about sort of the neighborhood interventions. It's interesting, LA is starting to struggle again. These things are sort of cyclical. So my team is spending some time back in LA trying to sort of get them, get them going again. Um, I do think we have collectively started to build a public health infrastructure across the city here um, that, that is really powerful. So I am, I'm hopeful. I do think we can, our goal, to, if we're going to get to those levels of violence, we need to get down to 100, 150 homicides a year. That's a 75, 80% reduction, and that has to be our collective goal. So there are important lessons there. Every city is a little bit different. But again, there's no reason why we should be this crazy anomaly, this crazy outlier relative to those other cities. I think it's, the last point I'll make, on the data transparency, it's important that all of us, CPD, us in the CBI community, we have to be transparent with data. We have partners that we started funding a couple years ago, very significant funding, um, that weren't, they were doing great work, had been in the community forever, but they were uncomfortable sharing data, uncomfortable being held accountable. And so we had to cut off that funding. And so we have to be very transparent with our numbers, where we're succeeding, where we're not. And I think if we're all doing that, that for me is like table stakes. We're starting to, starting to you know, build the kind of infrastructure in each neighborhood that we need. It's got to be transparency around data and outcomes. Does anybody yeah. else know? Yeah. yeah, to that data piece, right? I think data helps drive decisions. But it's also important that we all understand, and I know everybody in here does, but it, it bears saying. When we talk about data and numbers, we're actually talking about people. Lives. We're talking about families. We're talking about loss of life throughout our city. So we have to be cognizant of that, right? So we can set goals for success, but also we have to think about how we invest in communities, how we're wrapping our arms around these folks who have been traumatized on a daily basis, and how we work together to bring healing to these communities. And I just want to add that, um, so you, you probably heard a lot of people referencing data and data points. So let me add to that, and if um, you, you should buckle up because that, this is the basis on which we're going we're gonna to go forward and make this work. But the scaling of CVI, I mean, Arnie gave very specific examples in one neighborhood. They were serving 200 people, individuals in North Lawndale. That went to 600 by the end of last year, on its way to 700 out of the 1250 that he referenced, okay? There is a tipping point. He said you got to get to 60% plus. Um, you have to at least get to 50% to, to start to see that kind of turnover. And so the ask that we are going to talk about later is to raise $100 million to, ser to scale CBI in 10 neighborhoods. There are a little over 25,000 people who are in that same category of highest risk individuals in those neighborhoods. Our goal was to get to 12,600 people and, and touch them, provide those wraparound services. That's the goal. And so this is, and it's Austin, it's Garfield Park, it's Humboldt Park, it's Greater Englewood, it's Roseland and, and West Pullman, it's South Lawndale, it is Auburn Gresham. These are specific, the eight months that Eric touched on, right? Task Force starts in October of 22, the House released in June. What happened over those eight months? I just described it to you. Intensive data analysis on where the most acute needs are and where we can most effectively focus resources. Um, Deputy Mayor Gatewood talked about the fact that use of, of data to help focus uh, what the police are doing and what we're asking them to do and what we shouldn't be asking them to do. Um, these are all critical factors, but this, so to your question about data, it is infused deeply in everything that we've already done and that we will continue to do. So just rest assured, this is not a shoot from the hip kind of uh, yeah. activity in any way, shape, or form. 
And just the last point on Los Angeles, I, I do think leadership matters, and you had incredible leadership in the police department and uh, Connie Rice, a civil rights leader, working together to model what they wanted to see from their city leadership and in their community and bringing together the different sectors working on violence prevention and then consistent funding year after year after year based on data, based on need by the city. Uh, the city invested directly in trying to reform the police department and in trying to build the infrastructure for the community violence organizations to operate. So leadership really does matter. Just quick, real, real quick, sorry. Charlie Beck, amazing police superintendent in LA. He has a very interesting line that's a little counterintuitive. He talks about the goal being fewer arrests and less crime. I just want us to think about that. Fewer arrests and less crime. That's actually the sweet spot we're aiming for. All right, question. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone. My name is Mary. On March 12, 2012, my only child was killed due to gun violence. On the south side in the Grand Crossing community on Ingleside 79th Street, I took my pain into advocacy and I partnered with CPS schools, mainly Hirsch, because that's where my son blood lies on that ground. However, I'm frustrated, I'm stressed, because I keep hearing the community have to engage, the community have to step up. We did that with the advocacy work at Hirsch, Metropolitan High School, which is underserved, underinvested, under-enrolled, and it's a high crime community. Well, we took our own resources from funds that we raised with fundraisers and for private sectors, and we brought programs, restorative justice, culinary arts. However, Mr. Duncans, as you said, we have to find a way to be able to partner with CPS because even though I have an evidence-based program there, I've been pushed out by one principal. And the, and, the, and the reason being that I get is, well, he's the principal. And what I can't understand is that we're constantly being asked to step up and we're constantly being asked that we have to be in the community and part of the community in order to be led, and for the work to be led by the community, then why is this such a painful process trying to help our kids in the most disinvested community and underserved community because I'm going through that process right now at the school that we have been providing services since 2013. Yep. Yeah, I, I, we didn't just walk off the street. My son was killed in 12, so it was 2013, and we're going through this process now. So we would love to be able for it to be some protocol for the community that's doing the work, to be supported with the work that they're doing, and how could that happen? And Deputy yeah. Mayor, maybe you can help with that too. Yeah, so we can talk afterwards and we can exchange the contact information so we can see what's going on with you and try to get the ball rolling. That's a simple one. So let's find some time together after this one. Yeah, and full disclosure, Mary Long is a dear friend of mine and I have such admiration for the work that she's been doing. I think it would be so easy after the loss that you went through to just give up and you have been going at it. So I think we do need to find ways to make it easier for individuals like yourselves to be able to do the work and not create so many barriers and obstacles. So thank you for, for sharing your story and I will make sure Deputy Mayor has your contact information. And. and uh, Rosanna, if I can just add, our hearts go out to you. Um, none of us can imagine um, the loss of a child, but we stand on your shoulders as a business community and partnership with our elected officials, uh, with organizations like CRED and other nonviolence organizations to say that we're here to have a one table approach to make sure that we can engage with you and with our community so that we can listen and learn from you and then we can also share our thoughts and recommendations and our support to make sure that we can together make a difference. Good afternoon everyone, Aisha Oliver. As a longtime Austin resident, I've been there pretty much my entire life. Um, I work with a group of young people from my community 
and I've been with them since they were in third grade. These guys are now 20 and 21 years old. Um, I would like to know how you all plan to find those neighborhood heroes who don't have the million dollar budgets, but we have the most impact in our communities because we're born and raised there and we have constant contact with these young people. Um, but also I wanna ask you all, how would you address that very same group of young people, black males between 18 and 24 also have the most treacherous encounters with the Chicago Police Department. And it is a deterrent because these young people, we created a safety plan for our community and we've been doing it for three years. Super hyper local, we've made a lot of impact. And all summer, last summer, those guys were so discouraged because of their interactions with Chicago Police Department. Um, it really set those kids back because they felt like they were doing such a great job. So one of the things that I wanna suggest to you all is having more trainings where the police is, the, is, is learning from our young people. Because there's clearly a disconnect with a lot of them not coming from our community. They come with a mindset already of what it's going to be like and what these young people are like. And it, it, it really helps to you know, make the divide greater because they don't know how to interact with these young people. So I would like to suggest to you all that we start having conversations around the interactions with young black males between 18 and 24, but also how can the student become the teacher? Great, we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna, see if we have one more question, let's take that other question and I'm gonna let the panelists answer whichever questions. And, and thank you, I could not agree more with your, your comments about the need for police training. Hi. Hello, Victoria Bills. My question for you guys today actually kind of chimes a little bit into um, the lady that was just speaking. So we talked earlier about the police budget is about two to three billion in, for the city of Chicago, yet we also tapped in on the point of police ineffectiveness, even given that large budget scale. So would you or do you believe that perhaps there is a need for reallocation of those resources? Or do you believe that the police should be provided more resources in order to um, create more effectiveness in the neighborhoods that they serve. Great, thanks for that softball question. To close us out, I'm gonna let uh, whoever would like to take that question, take, no. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up after this, so any final comments that you have? Well, I feel like that question. Yeah. Feel like <laughs> so, a couple of things. First, to your point, uh, neighborhood heroes. We wanna work with everybody. Right, so really being intentional about that and getting past buzzwords like we can talk about training that's needed, but we gotta get to action. All right, folks need to actually build relationships with young folks in these communities, right? And stop with the over policing and criminalizing people for being black in their neighborhoods, right? For living in their neighborhoods, for living their lives. So we have to get to the point of action on that piece. To your point, um, reallocation of budgets. It's budget season, it's an interesting time. This is our first budget and we really think about what the needs are for the whole city, how we invest in the entire city. How do we think about the approach that not only CPD is taking, but what are we thinking about in safety overall? Um, we have asked CPD to take a deep dive on their budget to really look at how they're approaching safety, how they're approaching collaboration, and the mayor has a budget address um, in a couple of weeks. Where he'll really dig into what we're doing as a city uh, for the police budget, not just for the police budget, but for the budget overall. Um, what I will tell you is we have to, we have to work together more collaboratively to get the outcomes that we want and the outcomes that we need. So that means a different level of accountability and not accountability as a buzzword or not transparency as a buzzword, but people need to feel safer, right? Again, I know we can talk about numbers, right? But what's the number matter to a person who is impacted? You know what I mean? So we have to get to a place where we can actually make community safer. Um, and also understanding that, again, reiterating the point, safety alone is not CPD's job. Right? It is all of our jobs who step foot in this city, who cross through this city, even the folks who tweet me from Kentucky about the city, uh, since they're so invested from <laughs> Kentucky, um, they should be invested in the safety of the city too. So I'll let, um, are there steam folks yeah. on the Yeah, last comments. Arnie, do you want any closing comments? No, I, he, said it, he said it great. I just want to be really clear. This is the most gray, complex area. There are extraordinary police officers. There are police officers who do home visits with me to recruit people into our program rather than locking them up. Yeah. There are other police who tell our 17-year-olds, I can't wait till I'm putting a white sheet over you, meaning you're dead. 
Imagine if you're 16, 17 hearing that from police. And so we have to deal with both of those realities. It's, you know, it's more than training, but how do you have community respect? And Gary said it perfectly. As we think about 15 neighborhoods, this is not going to be a cookie cutter approach in 15 neighborhoods. Yeah. Who are all the nonprofits, churches, faith based institutions? Again, for you to be, you know, breaking your neck to do this work despite your loss. Austin, there's tremendous, tremendous need. We need all of those folks to be, you know, part of those tables in those communities, helping. And if, if we had, you know, 20 different groups serving 20 guys, then you're at 400. You know, there, there's a math to this, and none of us can do it by ourselves, and we have to start to scale. And so, I, again, I'm, I'm hopeful. There's an opportunity that I haven't seen in my seven years doing this going forward. It's going to be messy. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be complex. We're going to yes, yell and fight and scream someday. But five years from now, if we're not way, way lower than we are today, then collectively we would have failed, and we just can't afford to do that. All right, 23 seconds. I want to get invited back. So any last comments from either of you? Um, I'll just say quickly, um, so for the last five years, I, I've chaired the board of uh, Skills for Chicagoland's Future, putting about 1,300 people into jobs every year from the south and west side, uh, primarily something like 80% of our placements come from there. And there's a CBO collective, it's called the CBO collective of workforce related um, enterprises. It's unprecedented in the country. I tried uh, about eight years ago with Terry Mazzani, who was run running the Chicago Community Trust to do something similar. It failed. It's not been done. And I think that that is uh, sort of a, a model for how what you're seeing on the stage right now. This is the beginning of a new elevated level of collaborative and highly coordinated efforts. Um, so the, the, the specific asks of what we're looking for has to do with money, jobs, and, and resources, people, capabilities. Um, please take this with you and, and think about this because you will be hearing from us. Uh, if you want to learn more, there's a QR code for you to do, to do that. But I, I just want to leave you with a sense of optimism that if, I, if we can actually together um, pull a number of different CBOs together uh, and we can pull this uh, community together this way, um, we can get this done. And we have high confidence that with the people that are involved in it and with the collective effort um, of all of you that we can move the needle. I again, want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Mark and I approached this on behalf of the Civic Committee uh, as an honor, uh, but also with humility. We don't bring all of the answers, but we hope to work together to bring diverse perspectives uh, to tackle these important issues. Uh, we call on ourselves to be ambassadors on behalf of our beloved city of Chicago, and we're inviting you to join us on this journey and working together in this collaborative effort at one table. So thank you very much. Thank you again, um, Rosanna, Mark, Eric, Arne, and Gary, and um, for such an important conversation today. And um, I just want to reiterate, I think, what the call to action was, and I would really love for you to repeat this, because we're here as a community. The only way for us to make a change here is to do it together, and we have a room full of leaders. And if there is a call to action for the business community, if there's one, you know, one or two things we can all do today, what is that? Yeah, I think um, I, first and foremost, uh, recognize that every one of your organizations, you can find positions to hire CBI graduates and, and others that we are bringing along to uh, provide a different kind of pathway to. Just identify five or 10 in each of your organizations and we'll get to the kind of volume that we need to. It, we've got to start somewhere, though. We've got to begin that journey with a single step. So I would say that's one clear takeaway. The second is, for those of you who uh, are into math, you can take twenty or thirty thousand dollars per person. You heard the ROI associated with it, right? It's a, it's a stunning ROI, and you can say, well, Mark said there was twelve thousand six hundred people. That's half of the most at-risk communities. And when you do that math, you come up with a number like four hundred million dollars. So. For those of you who have cognitive dissonance and saying you're trying to raise 100, but there's a need of 400, the answer is, yeah, that's correct. But we have to start and recognize that we are ramping to, from a relatively modest level of engagement right now and throughput on graduates coming out of CBI programs to a very high level. So that's what that recognizes. Um, we're, not, we're, not being mis we're not misleading ourselves or kidding ourselves that it's not going to take more resources than that. 
But the reason why we felt that that was the right starting place is because we need to make sure that it's matched with capacity building. So those are the two things I would leave with you. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of our members and guests for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you all at an upcoming program. So please enjoy the remainder of the day and this uh, adjourns our meeting. Thank you. Thank you.